Hello and welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Sherry Lindis Bono, your host. This week on Genre Chat, if you like history and studying history, we have a special author for you. Her name is Melissa Stowe. Welcome, Melissa. Tell, tell um, the viewers a little bit about yourself and what you write and how you started writing. Hi, Sherilyn. Thank you for having me on. It's a real honor. I enjoy this. So, um, well, I write historical fiction. Um, my writing centers mostly in um, Ireland and the Middle Ages. So that's that's my passion. It, during specifically the Viking era, and uh, I've been writing for about sixteen years now. And uh, you know, I I did I have done other things. I, I actually started out writing fantasy before I wrote um, historical fiction, and I've written nonfiction articles for um, Her View from Home and First Corinthians Thirteen Parenting. Um, but you know, fiction has always been my first love, and so I always go back to that, and, and that's where I would really like to eventually become traditionally published through is historical fiction. Vikings are, are, are a hot topic at this time, and there's shows about them. So what intrigued you about writing about Vikings? Well, uh, that really came down to the research. You know, like I said before, um, I started out writing fantasy, and my first novel actually was a fantasy novel but um, it just wasn't working. It was kind of flat. And I've always had a love for story and I've always had a love for history. And um, during the time that I was writing my novel first, I was also researching a bit about our family history and, and we have so much mixed in, but a lot of the predominant was either German or Irish. And I thought I would like to know more about German or Irish history and I should pick one. And it would be cool if it coincided with my story as I was revamping it. And of course, Ireland won out. And as I was researching um, Irish history, I got into the era of Brian Beru, who is known as one of the most um, notorious high kings of Ireland. And everything fit, it just fell into place. It, the, the story I had as a fantasy novel was flat, the story world didn't work, but the characters were moldable, the concept was great. And I knew that it would fit into this era so perfectly. And so I began to transform my novel into a work of historical fiction. And it kind of grew with me as I learned about the period and I learned about the writing process itself. You had mentioned you started researching yes. your, <laughs> your family history. So I know as any kind of historical fiction, I know people who write for local, for, you know, like, they pick a certain period of time, like here, like like the the wars or whatever. How much time goes into research? And do you have any tips to um, conduct research um, adequate adequately and um, so you get the facts straight? Because there's a lot of junk out there on <laughs> on the web. Yes, uh, and, and, you know when I got started, I didn't have um, access to the internet. So uh, at the time, oh, you look too young. You look too young. You look. <laughs> well, Sorry, he just couldn't afford it at the time. So you know, it, it was around, but I, it was I expensive back then. Oh, it was. It was expensive. Yeah, I had to go around to my go up to my in-laws' house to get online. So in my house, I didn't have it, and so I did a lot of interlibrary loans. Actually, I did things very traditionally. I would get books and I would look at the back bibliography and get all my information. I'd look up topics and of interest or, or other books that were written on the subject and I would go at it. And um, at my first writer's conference, I actually got the privilege of speaking with a historical fiction author who edited my work. And she told me that she highly recommended for every factual bit of information you want to put in there that you're trying to present as historical fact, you need to make sure you have several sources that back it up. So mm. you don't want to just go with one or two. You want to make sure that, you know, most people agree with that fact. And you're always going to have some disagreements because some things are just hotly debated among historians. But Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, you definitely want to check out bibliographies and books. You don't want to, like, um, a lot of people will rely on Wikipedia. That one might be great for, like, a starting point, but never for a direct reference. Just go there for ideas, and then you branch off, and you find the, the, the sources, the um, 
I would really recommend um, trying to get in touch with people involved in what professions in that era, like historians or professors at colleges or um, reenactors because they, they've spent so much time learning that area too. And historical groups are a really good resource as well. That, wow. Now, do you look up, do you use any, um, did you use any Irish history books? Yes, I did. I, <laughs> I have shelves full of Irish history books. And um, online sites like um, libraries over in Ireland, I, I, directly got on those libraries and some of their their um, digital books are you know free to access and so you can check out a lot of books online now there's there's so many resources for um, Irish history so can you kind of recap a little bit some of the resources people need to use you said at l more than two can you give a list of the resources that you use beside the library you know like going online to their library and you also mentioned talking to professors at colleges who s specifically teach this. What were the other resources that you w mentioned? Well, one of my um, prime resources actually ended up being LinkedIn. Um, ah. I got it uh, several years ago, and through LinkedIn, you can find groups of you know professionals who are in your your you know niche, your area. And I found historical fiction groups and um, historical fiction writers. And I started getting into those groups and talking with those people and found, I mean, they're, they're all over the world. And I found people in the UK and in Ireland and connected with them and they gave me great resources and, and pointed out people that I could talk to and um, just made some really wonderful connections through LinkedIn. So the, that social connection there was really important. Um, but YouTube's another fun one. You can go there for reference and, and you can find um, documentaries and, and um, you know, historical talks by well-known professors, not just your average Joe. I mean, there's, there's really good resources out there online, um, aside from libraries and books. It sounds like you had a lot of fun doing this. It does. It. I love research myself. I love to research. And you're right. YouTube is a great source of because they they record a lot of a lot even ted talks but i'm not talking about that for historical but you learn a lot from youtube and the professors record a lot of their stuff but i never thought of linkedin that is a great resource thank you that that's great and groups and networking is is key networking is key now, what is one of the greatest lessons you've learned while writing in this genre? I know we're primarily speaking about um, your research for Ireland, but this could probably, any kind of research for historical fiction. What was, uh, what was your greatest lesson you learned? That, that is question everything. Everything. Don't, <laughs> don't assume, because... Uh, you know, historical fiction readers are history buffs by nature. I mean, they just, yes. they love it. And so if you put glaring errors in your period and they are a person who loves that era and knows a lot about it, they are just going to be turned off by your writing. So you really have to think, you know, am I going at this from actual fact or is this a stereotype or am I going off of popular uh, thought, you know, with things? Like, um, I, I actually was caught up in, in a, a stereotype, a popular thought from, you know, media and growing up and watching things um, when it came to dialogue. Uh, I always thought that um, the Irish uh, people, you know, way back when would say I to say yes or to affirm for something. If they were like the Scottish. And uh, Englishmen pointed out to me, no, actually, that's more common in Scotland and Britain. But in Ireland, in the original Irish language, there is no word for yes or no. So they oh, always respond, oh, wow. yeah, in the affirmative or the negative about something. So you say, do you like to ride horses? They say, uh, I do not like to ride horses. Or I do like to ride horses. But no, yes or no. And so that really changed my dialogue when I went in and write. I mean, you really think about how many times you would put yes or no in the dialogue. Oh. Yeah. So question everything. Don't assume. One thing that I I learned, and I think we may have been talking about 
Vikings, um, and maybe my friend Jake McCandless ancestry is Viking, okay. is that Vikings were savages and they just rampaged everything and none of them want, and none of them were Christian. But from my understanding, a, a, quite a few of them became believers. Is yeah. that true or is that? <laughs> Absolutely true. In fact, Vikings got a real bad rap because of them. A Viking is actually a term that wasn't used during the period and, and when it, the Viking word was used, I believe, in, in their culture, it actually referred to pirates. So a Viking was a, known for that, but not all Scandinavians were Vikings. And in fact, um, many of them, when they did come over, were establishing what was called a long port, which was like a settlement built around their ships. That was a protected area. And they um, would establish themselves in that area and then start to have relations with the people around them. And in Ireland, actually, the Irish clans were more known for raiding one another and monasteries than the Vikings <laughs> were themselves. The Vikings, if they got involved with it, were usually trying to ally with another clan. So, um, yeah, the Vikings actually made great strides in establishing commerce and trade in Ireland. Um, and yes, most of them became Christians later on. In fact, um, as different waves of Scandinavians came over from um, Norway and um, various areas there, they come and meet the people who previously came and say that they were more Irish than the Irish themselves. <laughs> Oh, that's great. See, that's that's why I like to research because, you know, you had mentioned check your sources, check your facts, don't believe everything. What other advice would you give writers that are writing in this genre? <laughs> well, you kind of hit on it. You better love to research. <laughs> If you don't, then you have to learn to like it because you really do spend quite a lot of time um, researching along with your writing. And, uh, you know, that it varies from person to person. Some people, you know, like to do half and half research and writing. Some people do more and it really depends on your topic and how much you know and how many uh, connections you have. But mm -hmm. yeah, you, you really want to um, be familiar with, with researching and willing to do it and um, to connect with people. Too. Like I mentioned before, getting in, con involved with um, different groups and, and contacting individuals because it's important. And later on, you might want to have those connections, you know, for somebody to check you your work, maybe a beta yes. reader or something and mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, this is good, but here you're off. And so, you know, having that extra pair of eyes that's knowledgeable in your genre is essential. Would you recommend getting an endorsement from like a professor? in that field i think if you can it would would be great it would definitely um you know validify <laughs> verify your yeah, validify i like that word <laughs> is that a word well we, we just made it a word validify <laughs> yeah it, it makes you look legit and and people yeah. you know, they, if they respect that source and they're going to be more likely to read your work how long did it take you to do all of this? I mean, how, I mean, to do good re, I mean, you can research, I can get online and research something for an hour and get a lot of information. But with something like this, I mean, give us examples of things that took more time to research than others. Um, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little, a little unique in that, um, I have been working on this project and the series. I've, I haven't been working on one book. I, I have seven books in work. And so I've been at this for 16 years, researching and whatnot. And, um, uh, and because I didn't have connections for the, you know, the first half of it online or anywhere, um, I had no resources to go to directly to begin the publishing journey. And I let fear hold myself back quite a bit. So, um, to sit to pick one particular thing and say how long it took that that's kind of difficult because there's so many things over that time span that, that have taken long um currently i i've begun to move more over into the viking aspect of it and i am uh reading a series of um theses by uh, archaeologists on the different um digs that they've been working on over in dublin and waterford and that has taken me um months to really go over that because it's 
you, you're kind of scanning through stuff, trying to find the things that you know you need in your story and passing over the things that you aren't going to use. And there is so much information. It's just a wealth of information. So it, it's, it's kind of hard to, and two, to find the time to do it, you know, apart from everything else you do. So it's, it's taken me quite a little while, but it, it really varies. You know, everybody has their own research speed and, and it's easy to get caught up in the, the rabbit trails, to get lost down the rabbit hole of research is what a lot of us say. And so, yeah, you got, you got to be careful. I think that it helps if you set yourself um, time, you know, constraints, just like if you do a reading, a lot of time for research. And, and set, when you set that time aside, make sure that you devote yourself to it. And mm. some people will even make like a, a list of the topics they want to find and, and that helps them, you know, streamline it. So it's faster. Now in your research, and I'm sure you read other historical fiction from other people, which is, an, which is good to do is to read other people who are writing in your same genre, not necessarily historical fiction on Ireland, but other places. But do you see a constant mistake that, um, people who write historical fiction make you had mentioned one which was um, conversation was dialogue what other mistakes do you see people making um, well, you know it, it can be very little things and, and a lot of times if it's plausible you can get away with it it really depends because historical fiction has you know it's, it's broad um, audience and so some especially the older readers tend to be more sticklers about getting your facts right while others are willing to you know give you some leeway if it seems plausible and they won't really look into it but uh, I've seen people um, mention dishware or things like that that didn't exist during that time period um, mm. it, getting um, you know even dates wrong I've, I've seen a lot of different things done and yeah in in my area of research that's a little more likely to happen because there isn't a lot left as far as the original sources um, to, to refer back to. And a lot of the sources are um, annals or what would be considered um, um, political writings that, you know, aren't very reliable, but they're biased, of course. And so, <laughs> we understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is hard sometimes to even nail down something as simple as a date because mm -hmm. though there may be differing sources on even that. What about, um, have you read diaries of anybody from that time? No, um, there, there weren't any during that time. I mean, we're talking 900 AD. And so the best that you can get is annals written by monks in, um, you know, monasteries, the ones that didn't get destroyed and raised. And um, the uh, propaganda pieces are usually the ones that um, give you an idea. There is one particular propaganda piece that I've read quite a little bit, and it's, it's, it's very popular for the time. I wish I could pronounce it for you, but I still, <laughs> still struggle with the Irish pronunciation of, of certain things. But um, yeah, it, it gives an insight into the personality, or at least what um, the ancestors of that person wanted to convey his personality as. Uh, and so you you get their their account of their his events and how he reacted to things, and it gives you an idea of where to go off of. And so there's stuff like that, but but no direct diaries, I'm afraid. I don't have that luxury in this time period. See, you, see, I didn't even know that. I didn't know people didn't keep diaries because that what 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 was that time period? Um, uh, Viking era. I'm doing the late Viking era, so that would be the tenth century and early 11th century um, uh -huh. the period of my book would be it starts in 962 AD so in the middle ages not very many people wrote mm -hmm. or read and mm -hmm. unless you were nobility or um, of a learned class that not many of them actually even wrote wow see learning something new every day so uh, and in my thinking would you, do you study would a historical fiction person study that same time era and what was going on in the rest of the world yes in fact I, remember, I think you should be familiar with the rest of the world and then how it influences that area because that is, can make dynamic changes in the culture too and i didn't um, narrow it down to just one um decade i researched before and after to kind of get a <sighs> of the history and how things changed 
um, just so that I, I understood the period better and the people better. So, yeah, yeah. That, 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 this is all great information, Melissa. So are there any books or websites that you would suggest to people who want to write historical fiction where they would go? Yes, um, actually, actually, I have, I wrote it down. <laughs> it's got to find where I suck it. Um, well, first off is um, the Historical Novel Society, and, and that's probably the, the one that comes to my mind right off the bat for anybody who's in historical fiction, because that's a great place to network and find just about anything that you could ever want to as far as historical fiction novels. I mean, not all of them are represented there, but a lot of them are. And of course, you can find other authors in that genre. And um, through my connection there and on LinkedIn, I discovered a, a woman, an, an author named M.K. Todd. And um, Mary Todd actually has a site called Writer of History. And there she interviews oh, yeah. other historical fiction authors. And she's even done surveys in historical fiction. So that's a great resource right there. Now, what is it called? Writers in history. It's um, all low caps, all run together. A writer of history. A writer of history dot com. Yeah. A writer of history dot com. Wow, great. And yeah, you learn so much because she interviews the authors about um, what they do in their book, what research they did, what what made their stories click for their readers, and so it, it's just great insight all around. Well, we only we only have like five minutes. Can you believe? I mean, it's it goes by so fast. You've given us so much great information, and I think one of the main things I think that you've been saying over and over is for historical fiction, research is so important, and then make sure your writing is good. I mean, and characters. Now, how would you develop a character? Um, and can you? discuss that maybe in a, in, in a minute or so from an historical past. Do you pick a person and kind of base your character on them? I, I have, and I've, I've read a lot of the folk tales of the time period and, and what was revered, you know, certain characters, you know, I have, I have characters who are warriors. And so I went and looked at what the ideal warrior was for the time period and, and what, what they, what they would have done, what they would have used, how, how they would have been skilled. Yeah, I, I referred um, to a lot of um, uh, cultural uh, tales and things like that to help me. How, imp how important are names? I think names are important. In some places you can get away with them. I have some Christian names in there that are definitely not Irish, but I think they would have been known. But most of the time I try to stick to original um, Irish and Scandinavian names because it lends that authenticity. If you use an odd name that wasn't common to your era, then that's going to turn off your readers as well. Because they know stuff. Readers are smart. I mean, I think that's one thing that I've learned is never underestimate the intelligence of the reader. <laughs> and then to pick names that aren't too difficult to pronounce. That's, that's what you see in that period, too. Or beginning with the same letters. Yeah. Now, who is your favorite author to read in this genre? Oh, that is a difficult one because I have, I struggle to pick the favorite authors as well as my favorite books. Like, I can't you, can, you can list a couple. You can list a couple. <laughs> um, I guess if I had to narrow it down, definitely um, Rock and Bodhi Taney are among my favorite authors. And then Francine Rivers and um, Stephen Lawhead also does work in historical fiction, though he's largely known as a speculative fiction writer. Uh, so there, those would be some of my top favorite. I writers. just got, is it Tannier? Taney. Taney. I just got their first, the book, of, uh, the first book in their series, uh, the AD Chronicles. That's an awesome series. I, my friend told me about them and I'm like, because I want to learn when I read. And you learn so much, in historical novels, you just learn so much. Yes, I, and I can't wait to read it. I know they're lengthy, but I, I, I have it upstairs, so. <laughs> and she writes so well, and her characters are so true to life that you won't even realize how long they are. You'll be feeling like that. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So tell us, you told us that you have eight books? Eight? Uh, roughly, yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to focus on the first two, and they are complete. 
Um, the first one has been through um, professional editing and I am submitting it to agents right now. The series is called Tale of the Clans and the first book is Rise of Betrayal. And um, in it, you meet Nessa, a farmer's daughter, who, um, whose family has kind of fallen on some hard times. They've struggled to rise up to a low level of mobility so they can have a voice in their clan. And they risk losing it all because they can't um, gather enough resources to get the renders to their overlords that they need to. And so her father has chosen to betroth her to their overlord son, who's a renowned rogue and just not a good, good guy at all. And uh, there's no seeming way out of this predicament, but then tragedy hits again, and she's left with a choice that causes her to become a fugitive because her uh, betrothed is killed in the process. And so she's on the run, and her rescuers that come in are an unlikely clan, and they kind of sweep her into this life that, that she thinks is going to take her away from everything, but ends up pushing her right back into all of it again. And she has to decide um, if she's going to help them in their endeavors to put the next um, provincial king on the throne. If she does, that's going to expose her to the clan she ran away from and the man whose brother is dead because of her. Ooh, sounds good. <laughs> so if people want to contact you, how would they contact you? Well, I have a website, mnstro.com, and uh, I'm usually around there. I'm also very active in social media too, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Pinterest. Can you spell your M-N, like Mike November? Stro yeah. is S-T-R-O-H, S-T-R-O-H, Melissa Stro. So you have mhstro.com? M-N Stroh. Oh, M-N, I'm sorry. <laughs> M-N Stroh.com. Do you have any parting words of wisdom? Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> um, yes, actually I do. We kind of hit on it earlier. Um, read broadly. Don't, don't limit yourself to just your genre. It's important that you read within your genres, but read broadly. I, I got that information from Randy Ingram Mason early in life, and uh, he advised all of his fiction writers, um, followers, that you want to read outside your genre because it helps you to think outside the box and to bring something new to the table that might not be commonly used in mm -hmm. that genre. So read broadly and um, Always be learning. Never, never assume that you've arrived. Because the minute you think you've arrived, you're writing and your your stories go stagnant. The, you're constantly learning. You're constantly growing as a writer. Mm. Thank you, Melissa. It was so nice talking to you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for Genre Chat here. Um, you can check us out at SeriousWriter.com. SeriousWriter.com under blog. Thank you and we'll see you next time.